<laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, we've got some Sorry, folks I can see in the back uh, grabbing food and drink. And so we will slowly get this started. But I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the panel on investing in climate change innovation. Um, we have some rock stars up here that I'm very excited about introducing to all of you. And um, the agenda that we will go through today is we'll do about 10 minutes of quick intro with all of the panelists. We'll have about 20 or 30 minutes of questions where I will do my best to elicit some of the genius from this group. Uh, and then we're going to, what's that? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> we, we practice. Um, and, and then we're going to open it up to you guys. Um, and so I want this to be a dynamic dialogue and discussion. And uh, hopefully we'll get to some pretty exciting uh, potential outcomes. What we would love everybody to come away with from this session is inspiration about what's happening in the climate change innovation space. Uh, there's a lot of doom and gloom out there, but there is also a lot of positive, exciting things happen, and I think this panel is happening, and I think this panel really represents that. Um, and I want you to go thinking how you can engage. So uh, if we don't do that, call us out on it. Tell us, I want to be inspired and I want to be engaged. Um, but let's get started. Does that sound good? <coughs> All right, I see head nods. Um, my name is Joe Spiker. I lead the Autodesk Foundation. How many folks are familiar with Autodesk? Whoa, that's fantastic. Uh, so for those of you who are not, we are a software company that uh, we make software for people who make things. If you've ever admired a skyscraper, if you've ever ridden in a car, if you've ever used a smartphone, if you've experienced a special effect in a movie, you've experienced what our customers are doing with our software. Our foundation's mandate is to leverage corporate uh, resources um, to create societal impact. So that's social impact and environmental sustainability through design and engineering tools. And we are focused on climate change. That is one of the biggest challenges that we have as a society. If you think about how people make things and what they are making, we can make them a lot more sustainable and we can make much more sustainable things. <coughs> so um, we'll talk about that more as the panel goes on, but I'd like to ask each of our panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves. Philip? I'm Philip Barnum, CFO of the Lummelson Foundation. Lummelson Foundation is a private family foundation headquartered in Portland, Oregon. Our founders, Dorothy and Jerome Lummelson, founded us 22 years ago. Jerry Lummelson was one of the most prolific inventors in US history, 604 patents, among them the barcode technology, Sony Wackman, 8-track tape. So we as a foundation are about invention. And in the US, that's really about how do we educate and inspire the next generation of inventors. And in developing countries, our tagline is improving lives through invention. So I'm happy to say that through all across our portfolios, environmental issues, climate change is present. Um, I'm happy to say that as a foundation, we've divested of fossil fuels and we've lowered the carbon footprint of our endowment. And on the grant side, every one of our grantees has to give us their environmental impact report. We funded things like Inventing Green. So environmental issues and climate change pervade everything we do from the endowment all the way through all of our investments. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Victoria Fram. I'm the co-founder and managing director of Village Capital. Village Capital is a system to find, train, and invest in the highest potential entrepreneurs solving what we called real world, real world problems. Um, and those for us are defined primarily within two buckets, one around social uh, and economic issues where we focus on affordable access to healthcare, education, and financial services. And then a second bucket uh, that's very relevant to our conversation here today around environmental sustainability and climate change where we focus on sustainable food and agriculture as well as energy. Um, we have two parts to our operations. One is a venture development program that we run around the world and across those five sectors that I just named. Uh, they're three or four months long, um, and we'll bring together 10 innovators that are working across uh, each of those sectors. So 10 entrepreneurs in energy working together for three months. They're full-time running a business and come together for four days at a time, three times. And uh, we have a unique way in which we deploy capital, which is the second side of our business, that we do through a peer review and selection process. So we think entrepreneurs, those people who are closest to their customers and in the markets where they're working, should have a say in how we deploy early stage funding. 
Um, and what we've found is that over time, that mitigates a lot of the bias and outcomes that we're seeing in early stage funding overall. So we've done this program 50 times. We've made 80 investments through it. About 15 or so of those have been in energy directly related to climate change. Um, and I'm excited to talk about some of them here today. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Yule. I'm the chief of staff at Elemental Accelerator. And I also um, work at an organization called Emerson Collective. Um, but I'm going to be talking mostly about Elemental Accelerator. So we're a later stage accelerator program. Um, we support companies in energy, water, transportation, agriculture, cybersecurity. Uh, we invest and um, co-deploy uh, innovation technology on the ground, um, investing up to a million dollars. So we're unlike any other sort of accelerator or incubator um, out there in this space because we actually do projects um, with the companies. Um, we've invested in over 60 <coughs> companies uh, to date and deployed over $35 million um, to those companies. We're announcing our 2018 cohort, so si go to our website, sign up for our newsletter, and um, be the first to hear about uh, who's, who's joining the portfolio. Um, we also practice something called place-based innovation. So what that means is we look at the problems of a specific um, place or community. Uh, we started in Hawaii, and so Hawaii has extremely high energy prices, a lot of abundant uh, renewable resources, but um, the sort of utility structure is, is, um, is set up in a way that we're not actually utilizing all of, um, all of the resources. So uh, we work with uh, utilities, PUC, regulators, schools, businesses, in order to bring in technology that is actually going to help uh, folks on the ground. Great. So last but not least, I'm Nicole Sistrom. I am the director of philanthropic partnerships at Prime Coalition. We are a nonprofit. Our mission is to empower philanthropists with the tools they need to invest in early stage, to invest charitable capital in early stage companies that could have an outsized impact on climate change. So we think of ourselves really as a two-sided marketplace, innovators working on climate uh, relevant technologies on one side and philanthropy on the other, and we really try and help the two sides speak to, speak to each other. Uh, one of the problems that, that we're responding to is just the really, uh, the huge capital gap that many entrepreneurs face in this space. So just a quick stat for you, PricewaterhouseCoopers reported zero initial investment in clean tech venture capital. So no new investments into new companies in Q2, Q3, and Q4 of 2016. Now, that doesn't cover everything. In fact, it doesn't cover Prime. Um, but just as an order of magnitude, it's sort of scary. Um, Prime has done, we facilitated six <coughs> investments to date in early stage technology companies, which is about $15 million in capital, investment capital that we've mobilized. There's 27 first time philanthropic investors included in that group. We're very, very proud of that. Um, and just excited to be here on the panel today. Yeah, thank you guys. I, I think we, th this organization of folks is an amazing collection, brain trust, if you will, of people who are thinking about how do we innovate climate change. And I'm gonna go a little bit off script here because we had discussed some questions, but <laughs> everybody talk. Oh, no. um, uh, a lot of the philanthropic capital to date in climate change is focused on policy and advocacy. And increasingly, you know, if you were a funder of uh, advocacy around federal climate policy, you're pretty upset right now, particularly this week, about what's happening. Um, and I think everybody here is thinking about this in a relatively new way, particularly on the, the solution side. So instead of the regulatory top down, how do we promote solutions? And increasingly, that's coming from the private sector. So I'm curious to hear from each of you guys, um, and maybe Nicole, we'll start with you. That, that shift of thinking in new ways about, um, you know, s regulatorily speaking versus like enterprise and innovation. Um, how is that happening and, and, and how quickly is it happening? Yeah, um, great question. So I, I can answer from the, like, the philanthropy world, philanthropy perspective. Uh, I guess the first thing to say is that there, there will always be a place for philanthropy to support policy advocacy. That's a great use of philanthropy. Um, but at Prime, we are really trying to help drive that transition. I think the transition 
to focus also on supporting solutions is happening. Um, we find that a lot of a lot of the funders that we work with are excited to work with us because uh, they're new to the space. There's some sort of generational transition happening within their own philanthropy. Um, maybe maybe they've been funding policy advocacy forever and they're frustrated by the sort of lack of progress. Um, maybe they're just getting really interested in impact investing and, and so we're, they come to us from that perspective that they, they really psyched about the sort of investment flavor of what we do. So I think the transition is happening. Um, we're helping build momentum. Every deal we do gets a little bit easier to do. Um, but I, there's a lot of room to grow. I mean, all, all of climate philanthropy today from foundations is something absurd, like 1% of all philanthropy goes to climate related anything. So there's a heck of a lot of room to grow and a lot of people on this panel are working on that for sure. Philip, you've been doing this for some time despite your young years. What right, are your thoughts? True. So I think, you know, the foundation in the US has programs in K through 12 and university education. What we're really trying to do consistently is to embed environmental issues and climate in the educational programs. We have a, a an issue, uh, we're talking about invention education. In invention education, we embed environmental issues in that. So what we're really trying to say is, if you get the youth, K through 12, and university folks who are already sort of wanting to know more about it, you embed it in that. So as a generation comes up, this isn't gonna be an issue anymore. This is gonna, for the young people, this is just something that is. Mm. We're also, last year we ran a competition called Inventing Green. So we, we went to our grantees and said, can you come up with ideas that are educational and all sorts of, so to embed green issues in everything we do. So we've supported green chemistry, inventing green, we now have an inventing green toolkit so the teachers can use that. So I don't, you know, we've, we've also become for the first time ever in our history, we're talking about advocacy and really being out there much more than we ever have been before in advocating for policy, what makes sense. And we actually don't use the term impact investing. We use the term investing because we see it as the investing for the 21st century. Yeah. It's just you do it because it's the right thing to do, it's the best thing to do. We also, in our university programs, that's all embedded. And in our investing with Village Capital and other folks, again, it's all embedded. So I think we've embedded it in everything that we do. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think um, from our perspective, uh, philanthropic capital can be more risk tolerant and help to cross that, that divide. And I think, Nicole, that was a little bit what you were talking about and, and feeding the markets there, talking about K through 12 work. Um, Victoria and Melissa, um, as leading uh, incubators and accelerators, I'm, I'm curious about what more besides capital do you guys bring to the space and how um, how that is helping to move it forward. And so, Victoria, let's start with you. Yeah, so um, our system that we surround entrepreneurs with in our programs is meant to uh, sort of downplay the, the promise that they might get funding out of our peer review model. And we actually, when we survey them and say, you know, why did you apply in the first place? Many of them will say at the beginning, because I thought I had a pretty good chance at getting an early stage check, and all of them at the end say, that was by far the least important part, and all of it was the community and the network and the resources that come out of the program. So um, recently, both last year and this year, and really excited to be working with Autodesk Foundation this year on our energy cohort, we've focused around transportation and logistics and the impact that that has on climate change, both from a energy delivery point of view, so how do we actually get energy to the places that it needs to go, um, and also with the energy um, toll that our transportation and logistics system puts on the environment. So I think a third of greenhouse gas emissions are related to transportation. Um, so what that means for what we do in the programs is have people on our advisory board and who come to mentor who are the chief sustainability officers from Walmart and UPS and a variety of other really big businesses that back to your sort of regulatory question, we're relying on big businesses and the economic choices that they are faced with leading us all to a path that will be more sustainable. So as costs come down for more sustainable sources of energy, um, we're seeing people no longer make sort of a, a heart-driven choice, but an economic 
driven choice, that they realize that um, it's actually, you know, the, the dollars and cents of their bottom line are dependent on them finding more cost-effective ways to, do, to doing things. And by the way, that also means things that tend to be better for the environment. Um, so we can talk about a couple of the models that have ensured that, but um, we really think about in terms of more than money, surrounding entrepreneurs with the resources that they need to think about scaling their businesses, not just with capital, but with human resources and strategic advice and connections within their own existing supply chain that will help them scale a lot more quickly. Yeah, that um, I couldn't agree more. That's what uh, our model is as well. It's the building the ecosystem around the entrepreneur. A lot of times the, the companies come to us not looking for capital, as you say, but looking for connections. We have um, uh, partnerships with global utilities from all over the world, and those are really important because in order to, to enter a partnership with a utility, it looks different. No one knows where the front door is. People are coming in through the chimney, through the window. And so, um, <laughs> so startups, that, that's really hard. I mean, they're, they're cash stressed um, and stressed by other issues. So um, when you can sort of bridge that, um, that relationship gap, it's really important. Um, but I also wanted to talk about regulation and policy. I mean, we're, we're talking about on the maybe global or national level, but what we do a lot for our companies is work around policy and regulation on the hyper-local level or, or the state level even, which is where a lot of energy um, and water policy gets made. And so, uh, for example, one of our companies, STEM, does it distributed um, energy management. Uh, they put batteries in buildings and help them um, bring down their peak load, but also uh, turn over that suite of batteries to, um, to the utility to use as a distributed energy resource. And that was a framework that wasn't uh, available under the current regulatory um, landscape in Hawaii. And we actually worked with STEM and the PUC to pass that rate case. And what's so interesting about um, STEM is that they're very focused on policy because you know policy picks winners and losers no matter what. Um, and uh, and their whole approach was to create a framework that allowed more than themselves to be able to compete in the market because they, they said that every, um, every viable market has at least two competitors. Um, mm. We also work with uh, our companies on um, battery storage permitting. And so this is like mm. as granular as going to like a 20 person department of planning and permitting meeting super you know, in the books about changing the building code, but that actually greases the wheels and accelerates the, um, the permitting process for a lot of our energy storage companies. And so it's, it's getting in the weeds, getting really close to, to the problems um, that, that, um, that we see really makes a difference on the ground. And from the, from the entrepreneur and market perspective of how do we unlock this. Um, uh, Nicole, would you add anything in your role from Cyclotron Road uh, in terms of the support of entrepreneurs? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, I also work with uh, a, another program, a early stage fellowship program for um, hard science entrepreneurs called Cyclotron Road. And in addition to a lot of just kind of the bread and butter networking support that um, these ladies uh, work on every day. Um, Cyclotron Road is also focused on helping those really early stage entrepreneurs find the lab resources they need to do really hard R&D. That stuff is really also difficult to get funded these days and difficult to and expensive to pay for, especially if you're an early stage company. Um, but I would, I mean, I'd echo a lot of what they said. I mean, one of the one of the things that we stress, even at the very early stage, and that Cyclotron Road companies have gone on to Elemental, and um, you know, hopefully, we'll go to Village Camp <laughs> someday. Um, but even at the very early stages, that connection to industry players, big industry players, helping them think through, helping our entrepreneurs think through where their technologies could play, and making sure that they're developing something someone wants to buy someday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the inspiration part. And Philip, let's start with you. What are some of the best opportunities that you see in the funding space for supporting climate change innovation? Ignore the current administration. Um, <laughs> I think for, for us, it's really, um, we become a lot more public than we ever have been before. Yeah. I mean, when we joined the Divest Invest, that's probably the first time we've ever gone public. We've been at this since 2006. So I think our board felt very strongly that we need to be out there 
and inspire other foundations to divest and reinvest their endowments. So a lot of foundations still say, you know, we're going to make a mess over here, but our grants don't worry, we're going to clean it up. Hmm. So for us, we wanted to inspire foundations. And again, we also want to inspire more foundations to go really early. We go pre-prototype, we go very early. We also try to be very catalytic with our funds. We'll come in and place a CFO, we'll place, we'll do a loan, we'll do, so really getting people to try different things to help these companies, because I think we need to inspire the folks out there that these companies are worth investing in, bring corporate players in, bring in other philanthropies and other foundations who really are still looking at market rate returns. So I think a lot of what we do is trying to be catalytic and be inspirational for the industry to help other people. I mean, that's really one of the reasons why I went into Village Capital very early on. We wanted to show people that funds like Village Capital can be successful. So we've done that in a number of funds. So we tend to go in first or second as an inspiration to everyone out there to say, you can do it, it's a good thing to do. And also I'm really lucky because our board is very embraces, we're a long-term investor. We also are, will embrace risk. So it's also inspiring other people. You know, that's what philanthropic capital is all about. I mean, that's why we're out there. You've inspired us. We, we have a, a, a co-investment that we're terrified of that you guys take the long-term view and, <laughs> and de-risk it. I'll the be there all yes. the way. I oh, is that a commitment? Yes. <laughs> Okay. So we also de-risk no a lot for people, so, you know. <laughs> yes, Co-investors exactly. as therapists, it's a good, <laughs> good model. Yeah, well, we'll take your house first. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> can you do that? Uh, Victoria. <laughs> I'm that cheerful. <laughs> 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 um, so, as I mentioned, we take a, a very broad view of how we can sort of impact climate change. I would say that, you know, we're a small early stage fund and I think oftentimes people have a bit of an intimidated uh, view to like the scale of this gigantic problem that we're all facing as a planet and the perception that most energy investments are so capital intensive that how could I actually make an impact at the early stage. Um, so we're focusing on uh, innovations and enterprises where we see some amount of capital efficiency and certainly you know we're not going to be the only ones that write them a check and we will look for PRI philanthropic sources or uh, you know non-dilutive used to exist some amount of government funding we hope won't disappear entirely but um, in, in the last four or so investments we've made we have been one piece of a an overall funding picture that has um, been complemented by DOE funding and other PRIs and then commercial sources of capital. Um, some of the, to get a little bit more specific about sort of the energy transportation nexus, that's meant we've invested in companies like Idle Smart out of Kansas City that has a hardware and software solution to reduce the fuel that's wasted as trucks spend a, an inordinate amount of time idling um, and wasting fuel to keep their drivers comfortable um, overnight or while they're on the road. So they have a governor that now helps uh, drivers better manage that idling time, reducing the overall uh, fuel waste of the truck, but also bringing their truck lines online much more of the time because they're not doing cold starts in frigid conditions in, you know, at 2 or 3 or 4 a.m. Again, one of those things that trickles down to the bottom line of the business. Um, or a micro combined heat and power um, distributed solution that's based out of Houston, Texas called Entrigen um, that helps sort of integrate the um, renewable sources of energy with grid uh, sources and can be an on-site power generation um, uh, innovation that incidentally was super useful to people in Houston post Harvey when even if they weren't flooded, the substations around them were offline and they had no source of power. So we're seeing a lot of these things kind of not only try to preempt um, the climate change problems, so mitigate what we've already created, but also be a source of adaptation and resilience when people get into um, what is increasingly terrifying, the number of natural disasters that we've had over the last few weeks and months even. Yeah, and no one has a face mask on here, but... Can I, I just add something? Yes, so please. So you use the term PRI. A PRI is a program-related investment. Yeah. So fan for those of you who are not foundation folks, PRIs are a way that we can invest equity, debt, 
We have a vi wide variety of tools that we can invest in funds and companies that can really go a long way to support funds. We have, a, in the U.S., we have a broad array of tools we can use. We've used those in India. We use them all over the world. And again, it's one of our tools using philanthropic capital into funds with equity that we can move markets along, and we've, we've done that a lot. And again, we would find, you know, if we've done it, other people can do it, and we'd inspire them to use it. But that's what a PRI yeah, is. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say the creative work that um, Prime is doing, Bill Cap and the Lemos Foundation are doing around um, driving investment and um, and funding into energy innovation and, and demystifying um, sort of the, the uh, misgivings about it is, is really great. I'm, I'm going to take a different tack. So what, what we do besides funding and the network thing is I think we also try to tell a story um, and wrap a story around the entrepreneurs that brings uh, somewhat like hard to understand technical um, uh, sort of like behind the meter, really utility, not sexy stuff um, to, uh, to, you know, 10 folks so that people can actually understand how these um, innovations are impacting their day to day. So, so we help the entrepreneurs a lot with storytelling. What we also do is I think we um, create a culture in the corporations that we work with and the global utilities that is not afraid of innovation and not afraid of failure. And when you're in the Bay Area, failure is, you know, fine, but to the rest of the world, I think it's, um, it's still a foreign concept. So, uh, we, we actually um, create a little competition, uh, a feeling of competition, friendly competition among the um, corporates and the utilities that we bring together. Um, we convene them a couple times a year and um, in talking to each other and trading stories about um, issues that they're facing in terms of um, adapting to a transforming grid and um, energy structure, we sort of uh, put them on the spot and, and ask them to, to talk about how many investments they've made in energy innovate, innovation companies, how many pilots they're doing, you know, what, what's the trajectory for that. And we've seen actually through this really innovative sort of new program called Free Electrons that we're partnering with, with uh, um, CalCEF um, and, and several other organizations is that when you put utilities on the spot, they want to outdo each other in terms of how innovative they are. And um, it's a really funny way to gamify um, the business, <laughs> the process of, of getting business. So um, we're, we're trying to get creative like that. Very cool. And I want to come back to some of the place-based stuff that you guys are both talking about. But Nicole, what's the most, what, what are some of the most inspiring opportunities that you see? Um, in terms of uh, philanthropic, Opportunities to In investment opportunities. Investment opportunities. Well, I, I guess the sort of general point I would just make is there are a lot of companies out there working on climate innovation. Um, Prime looks at this year we looked at 2100. Like th there are just a ton. So there there are definitely companies out there. Um, a couple of specific examples from companies that have made it on our docket. Uh, one of them is called Opus 12. They are uh, their technology changes CO2 uh, waste stream into high value chemicals. And the sort of long range vision of that is, um, our f is fuel that is carbon neutral. Um, so things like that I think are, are really exciting. Um, if I had to say two other things, um, I think just philanthropic opportunities, there's a lot of opportunity to, to juice up the connection among the different ecosystem players, I think, around climate and innovation. And, and sort of one specific example of that is, I, I think we could all benefit from more connectivity between the different types of, of funders. So like, if you're a software company and you're here in Silicon Valley, like you know, uh, for the seed stage, like here are the seed funds, I'm gonna talk to these seed funds. And then, and then I kind of march down Sand Hill Road and I talk to this funder and that funder, and then you know, there's a path to get to scale. I think in the climate change space, um, we, well, A, there's room for m different types of funding models, but there's definitely room for philanthropy to help these ecosystem players talk to each other better so that we all, all, all different ki types of funders can kind of gain confidence that someone's coming down the line to help get that entrepreneur um, to, the, to the level of impact we want them to have. And then, and then if I had to back way up, if policy advocacy is your thing, there's a lot of room to fund policy advocacy around innovation and R&D. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think that is one of the, um, 
a lot of climate policy focuses on, you know, very sort of high level stuff. Um, and then we end up with a clean power plan that can get thrown out. Right. Um, but uh, I think R&D, uh, sort of early stage innovation funding, that's, that's a bipartisan idea and, and still has a lot of momentum behind it. Yeah, I, I, have, I have one exciting thing that actually was a result of, a, of a, uh, an interaction at Cyclotron Road's demo day where it's very self-serving, but um, there was an organization called CalWave and I, I, I met the founder, I was familiar with it in your docket companies, and they said, oh, I think we, uh, we owe our existence to you guys. We've never given them a dollar, um, but we funded the ASME I show, which is a hardware competition globally. They won the ASME I show. That w gave them their first funding to put up a website and fly some folks around. Um, and then we gave them a software donation, and they said they were able to use that to unlock an ARPA E grant. Yeah. So, like, which to me is the highest and best use, particularly of corporate philanthropy, is sure. like to, like you were saying, to leverage other opportunities. And I thought it was so valuable. And I think all the work that you guys are doing is incredibly valuable in de-risking and unlocking this space to a significant degree. Um, uh, Victoria and Melissa, you guys are both talking. You know, you have unique geographic perspectives. Nicole just mentioned Sand Hill Road. The majority of funding um, in innovation goes to three states. I've read Ross's book, or it's actually, I'm reading Ross's book. But I wonder if you guys can talk a little bit about um, okay. some of the opportunities <laughs> um, in terms of, of place and geography and where folks aren't looking. Yeah, so um, the one of the statistics that, that <laughs> we have so another panelist. In the back. <laughs> Lots of dogs, it's behind the stage. <laughs> um, so <laughs> he's, aptly timed barking. Um, yeah, one of the things that we pay a lot of attention to is that uh, the way that venture dollars are being allocated today, we think is likely doing all of us a great disservice, um, not just in the diversity of thought that we're getting to get solutions on the table, but also on the impact that we're able to have because people who are experiencing a bunch of problems that we want to solve actually are not getting a shot at actually, you know, getting the capital or resources that they need to try to solve them. So 75% um, of venture dollars goes to just three states in the US, California, New York, and Massachusetts. 90% um, of our investments are outside of those three markets. So, and that's including our global scale. I think that 75% number goes to 50% if you're looking at all venture dollars globally. Um, so we locate the programs that we run in places where we think um, we'll be able to leverage some of the strategic assets that are already based there in making some of these connections, um, getting people access to customers, and so forth. So that's meant um, holding energy um, work that we've done in places like Houston, where there's a lot of traditional oil and gas mentality that is slowly trying to shift to think about how they incorporate more sustainability in energy uh, harvesting and distribution. Um, or Fort Collins, Colorado, where there's a lot of um, innovative research being done and a couple key partners of ours that have been helpful in, in pushing um, our work forward. What that has meant for um, how we think about sourcing innovation is, is also um, outside of those key markets. Um, and we've been lucky to do some work internationally with Lemelson um, around invention and hardware that has led to some really interesting energy investments for us. Um, and again, I think one of the key things we've learned there is that access, um, Nicole mentioned, you know, lab access on the hard science side, um, access to just basic tooling and machinery um, equipment uh, is so much more scarce in emerging markets than it is here. And so um, we were lucky to work with both Lemelson Foundation and Gearbox in Nairobi um, to put a, a hardware cohort of innovators together, again, thinking about like what, are, what assets are there locally that we can leverage um, to try to get people who have an idea and just need a little bit of support to get that idea to fruition, um, the, the difference between them making it and not. Yeah, um, unlikely geographies for innovation is something that we're challenging ourselves with um, right now. I mean, Hawaii, I think, is not a place you think of that um, would attract a ton of entrepreneurs, but um, if, you, if you add the right ingredients and stir it up, I think you can create that environment. Uh, right now, though, we are uh, focused actually on California, um, and this is part of our work with the Emerson Collective. Um, so 
really focusing on communities um, that are most affected by um, climate change, um, that are being left behind in this um, transition to new economies. And so really interested in how do we attract um, innovation, technology to places like East Palo Alto or Stockton or others that are right next door to some of the most um, innovative cities in the world, but are yet the people, the communities are not experiencing um, the same fruits of, of that um, economic growth. And so our challenge right now is to look for high growth entrepreneurs who, um, who are really bringing clean energy solutions to market, but who also have the capacity to deploy them in places that are not likely um, and, um, and, but at the same time could benefit the most from them. So, um, for example, uh, one of our companies, Freewire, uh, they recycle Second uh, Life Nissan Leaf batteries. They put them together in a pack and they um, uh, put them in a robot and you can deploy them to charge uh, uh, electric vehicles. And that um, negates the, the ne necessity of actually drilling holes in the ground and, and building charging infrastructure. So it's a lot cheaper. It also opens up um, the ability for renters uh, who might not have one of those plugs in their home for renters uh, to, to have access to, to um, uh, energy charging resources. And uh, Freewire can also use their technology um, as a replacement to diesel gen sets, um, which are used a lot on site for um, food trucks or small businesses or construction. And so on, on the micro scale that um, replacing a diesel, dirty diesel gen set that is not regulated at all. There is no restrictions on how dirty that can be um, with, with something clean like this can really uh, improve, um, improve life on, on a, on a hyper-local scale. And so we're, we're looking for companies where their value proposition is, can be realized in, in unlikely places and starting in California. <laughs> Can I? Yeah, please. I think I think incubators, accelerators are like are such super great vehicles for local kind of points of view. Um, and I just to maybe put someone on the spot. I see Ben Gaddy from the Clean Energy Trust <laughs> in the audience. So he's I, Clean Energy Trust is another great group that is focused on Midwestern energy innovation. So um, just another shout out there. Yeah, I think I think there's a big theme here around driving local innovation. I do want to open it up to questions, and I actually um, didn't get, oh, we've got a mic rolling around, and we've got a couple of hands coming up, uh, two right here. I'll let the microphone choose. Hi there, Chris Page from Seattle. Um, I'm wondering if you all have any thoughts, either known examples or hypothetical examples of investing and in accelerating the retirement of coal plants in the US. Not from a policy standpoint, because I don't think we're going to get anywhere on the federal level there, but just from the standpoint of a lot of um, wind and solar is becoming, has reached grid parity, um, but a lot of these coal plants are midlife. They have another 15 years left. Yeah. Have you seen examples of people putting together investment structures to retire coal plants, or is that something that people are talking about? Yeah, and actually, why don't we take a couple of questions? So why don't you get the gentleman behind, and then we'll aggregate and get responses from the team. Thanks, uh, Adam Flint from the New York Energy Democracy Alliance. Um, we're working on putting together a national fund to support community shared solar projects in four or five states that uh, would contribute to being able to bridge the access gap for low and moderate income communities and communities of color. And I realize I've walked into a, a panel that's talking about investing in for-profit companies. So I'm wondering, is, is that a fine and bright line in your world? Do you find that your focus right now because of the fact that we are experiencing a rather uh, insane administration right now in policy, is that having a greater impact in shifting towards the for-profit sector or is it simply a question of finding innovative solutions wherever they may be arising? Um, and let's, we'll do two questions each and then uh, another round. So um, panelists, responses, retiring coal plants and low profit investment so um we haven't done anything ourselves in retiring coal plants but i was just speaking to a co-investor an airbnb -E from candide group who is working um uh on retraining former coal miners in west virginia to install solar um so 
I don't know what that means for what happens to the 15 year remaining life of the plant, but at least, um, you know, it's, there's not just a, an energy issue around it, but also an employment one that I think if people start to see that it's not the end of their livelihood if they stop working at a coal plant, um, that hopefully there's some gradual shift around the regional openness to saying we have much cleaner and now cost competitive sources of energy. So um, at Elemental Accelerator, we only support for-profit um, companies because we um, want to see them someday stand on their own. Um, although I think the, the, the blending of for-profit and non-profit is really necessary and, um, and interesting. And we actually have come across several companies that have a non-profit arm that does a little bit of um, a different kind of work, but then on the other on the other side, they um, they have a for-profit business, um, and I think that's probably something that you're going to see a lot of under one roof. Um, with my other hat, they they do a lot of for-profit and non-profit support, um, especially in uh, in this area that I think is a really um, great solution. So I would say we do both. I mean, we're you know we invest in companies, but we also invest in non-profits, and particularly. If you're using grant funding for something that's very early stage or maybe it's a different concept, we would, we would use grant funding and many times that goes to a nonprofit. So we would sort of look at what the need is and the tools that we have to use. So we wouldn't sort of discriminate either way. I mean, it would depend on a fund. Of course, they're for profit, but we do a lot of nonprofit work. And the only work we've done in coal, we've studied carbon capture to see if that's really a viable way to capture the carbon produced by some of the coal plants. Um, that's something new for us. I think we're still looking at it. There's a lot of people say it's, it doesn't work, but I think the study would indicate that it could be financially feasible to do that. So that, that would be our only role in kind of carbon, you know, coal fired power plants. I think on the coal question, it was interesting, your, your mention around um, employment. And I think that's what's driving a lot of the policy decisions right now around uh, employment in the coal industry, uh, interestingly enough. And um, uh, Generation Investment Management has a philanthropic arm, and they just released a paper, Transforming Finance, that talks about the role of the workforce in a, in a low carbon future. And it's really interesting reading, talking about how we need to actually transform our workforce. And it's not from the AI automation future that everybody's typically talking about. It's from a low carbon perspective, and I think it's great. New York Times also did a great article last weekend training coal miners for solar installation. I would also add that our founder 25, 30 years ago, his whole thesis was that America wasn't being creative, it wasn't making anything anymore, it wasn't creating jobs. Does this sound familiar? So I think what we're trying to do now is say <laughs> that yes, we agree, and we, what we would like to do is bring, have America manufacture goods that don't have a carbon footprint, they're environmentally responsible, that add to climate change. So, but that's the 21st economy, and we would say, that that's our whole thesis, getting America back to work, however, back to work with these kinds of industries. So, yeah. I mean, that's how we're trying to blend, make our message more acceptable in this interesting world. This is the, the undercurrent here is, is the entrepreneurship drives yeah. job growth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you're incredibly good at um, euphemistically undercutting federal policy. I really it's enjoy it. It's called sneaky. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I, the whole thing was we're trying to figure out, given the current administration's, you know, influence, how can we craft our message yeah. to sort of be acceptable? It's like we've done the same thing in India, where India, the Modi government is very fond of coal-powered power plants. So a lot of clean energy and clean tech companies are now saying it's not only about clean energy, it's about livelihoods, job creation, poverty alleviation. So it's like, how do you, how do you get your products under, under the radar when you have a governmental administration who's not favorably inclined? So it's like, yeah, nobody can argue with innovation and job creation. Like that's uncontroversial. So we have a couple questions. Yeah, we've got one in the back and one in the front. Yeah, my name is Paul Stevers and uh, Brookings is uh, research shown that one of the best uh, investments against climate change is girls' education. And uh, so it seems to me that, that any, any serious talk about climate change should include that. What are you guys been thinking about innovations in, in accelerating girls' education across the world? 
And we'll take one more question, and then and you're, you're up next, sir. Uh, Christopher Phillip, I'm the e-learning director for the Climate Institute in Washington. Uh, we've had some work with the tribes. There are 400, excuse me, 562 sovereign nations that have among them the best wind power regime in the upper Great Plains and the best solar regime in the Southwest. They have their own companies, Sacred Power and the Navajo and the Ho-Chunk Winnebago in the Great Plains. And I'm wondering if you have any uh, efforts to work with uh, developing companies that are in fact sovereign nations on our own soil. Thank you. Great question. Wow, the worst question. Um, I can uh, speak to the um, whole women in, in innovation question, or women in climate change. So we uh, actively try to recruit uh, female entrepreneurs and um, we put our finger on the scale when we <laughs> select companies. Uh, we also um, host an internship program uh, where we find 10 interns to uh, work with our startups and we um, heavily try to recruit for um, young female uh, high school students and college students to, um, to get them access to, to renewable energy or innovation jobs. Um, I think that exposure and, um, and seeing more role, female role models in, um, in innovation and in energy innovation is, is a great way to um, bump the numbers up. I was gonna say we also have a focus on, um, we have a program in Africa that's really about letting young women know that they can have um, careers in science and technology and that you know, that's a, a program that really say this is an opportunity you can be included and we also have that emphasis in the US, particularly around female entrepreneurs and engineers and scientists and really, in fact, our board chair is our own foundation where it's really about bringing young women into the system, particularly homeless young women and letting, letting them know that they can have careers in science and engineering and technology. So it is a side for us also. Um. And speaking from Autodesk's perspective, in terms of like STEM and STEAM education, the, um, uh, there's a lot of research to suggest that if you want to get more women involved in these STEM, STEAM careers, um, make it more impactful. Um, basically focusing on the social and environmental outputs of, of engineering tools. And actually there's a, 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 a woman named Lena Nielsen, formerly of Berkeley, who's done a lot of research around this, around engineering programs. Um, that have social and environmental aspects have a much higher uh, rate of uh, women in the programs than men. And so I think that's a lot of what we're talking about today. And I think by virtue of some of the work, um, you would see uh, higher gender diversity in the work. With regards to the question around um, uh, sovereign nations in the United States, I, I learned something um, from that question that I did not know about and would, would, would welcome uh, the opportunity to learn more. Uh, we do work with an organization called the Catapult Design um, that does do a lot of work um, with the Navajo Nation and a few other sovereign nations in the United States. Um, and, um, but uh, does anybody have anything to add to that? I did not, I was not aware of, yeah. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't directly, uh, but this is a good thing for me to think about, so thank you. Yeah, questions? We've got an enthusiastic questioner at the front. Thank you. Thanks for mentioning about adaptation and resilience. Uh, I work in the media bond industry, which is the, the primary industry right now responsible for dealing with funding adaptation called rising sea levels. Uh, the primary area where that type of adaptation gets stuck is what we call pre-development costs. Mini bonds are great for long-term project finance. Our industry is terrible at financing entitlements and design takes to get entitlements. And that's where projects get stuck. There, there's adaptation projects for rising sea levels in most of the major metropolitan areas of the country, and a lot of them are really stuck right there. The question for this group is, would you consider expanding your horizon to, to turn, I'll call it pre-development investment and adaptation infrastructure into impact investing? So let me, I mean, for us, you know, because we're about invention, we come in very early. I mean, a lot 
lot of our programs fund ideas, infrastructure. I mean, it, we find it really necessary to work with the inventor entrepreneur very early on to get them to the point where they even have an idea that could come to Village Capital. So I think that's what we're all about. We have several, we have a program at LMIT, we have a several venture well program that's a university program that's really about how do you surround the inventor, the entrepreneur with what they need to get there. So we have funded research, we funded prototyping, we funded, so I think we're one of the few in addition to Autodesk that will go that early and fund very early from an idea forward. So we haven't seen you do that. So. Um, I, I would just say uh, there are a couple it's of examples of uh, in the philanthropic world where I think that sort of speak to this question. The super classic one is OPIC and the, I, do you guys remember? It's like the African. Overseas Private Investment Corporation? Yeah, right. but yeah. it's like the African Development Fund or something. Mm -hmm. Basically yeah. the OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation works. Um, I think it's a pseudo federal agency. Yeah, uh, federal it agency. is a federal <laughs> agency. And they were having a similar problem where they want to invest in large utility projects, renewable energy utility projects in Africa. Um, but uh, no one was willing to fund that first kind of project development, you know, the little bit of money you need to get your environmental surveys and do your initial sort of. Um, and so they partnered with some major philanthropies to put up uh, some, some philanthropic but investment capital uh, to, to fund that early work. Um, so there are, there are models for what you're talking about, for sure. And, and I would just add that for us, that's usually grant capital, or we've worked in India for a number of years and we use service agreements, we use, we've created technical assistance pools. That, so for us, that's pre-investment money, that would be grant money, that would be CERT. And I imagine you are familiar with Rockefeller Foundation's Resilient Cities initiative and yeah. Uh, putting on my Autodesk hat as well as the Autodesk Foundation hat, we, we do design software for civil engineers and are very familiar with the constraints in this space. And a lot of it has to do with, particularly in big infrastructure projects or in a lack of investment um, in uh, productivity enhancing tools. Uh, and it's really structural and due to uh, the nature of the industry in and of itself, of the boom and bust cycle and, and the time horizons that tend to exceed the business cycle. And so it's much easier to lay off an individual than it is to, uh, you know, amortize the cost of the simulation software that you paid for five years ago, right? And so um, what's interesting is, is there's, there's a couple of things happening that would change that. One of them is, is the rise of, of basically automation um, and AI that can do things much cheaper. You don't have to invest all of that upfront capital in the simulation capability because now everybody's on the cloud and infinite computing power. So there's some indicators to suggest that things change within the industry. Um, we, we care about adaptation as much as we care about mitigation. The problem with adaptation is that everybody defines it differently. Um, even Rockefeller's 100 resilient cities, you can hire a CRO and it's purely on social resilience, right, versus sea level rise. And so it makes it really challenging to have a very specific thing. And, and I liked how you put it, this is an infrastructure issue. There's a really cool kind of lighthouse example funded by Rockefeller um, here in the Bay Area called Resilient by Design. Uh, you might be familiar with this. Ah, okay. So we got, so we got to where you were leading us, yeah. And, and we are a technology partner of RBD and, um, and are actually looking to do some grant funding for some of the projects. But it's a really interesting, and, and I'll, I'll speak for you, you can correct me. It's a really interesting example. Um, Rebuild by Design was an adaptation project that was done with HUD, Housing and Development, and Rockefeller many years ago after Superstorm Sandy came through New York. HUD wanted to do something more interesting with the funds to build back better. And so they partnered and it resulted in 10 projects around New York and New Jersey to uh, improve the infrastructure for climactic events in New York and New Jersey. Here in the Bay Area, we're actually doing the, I would call uh, prevention as opposed to treatment and preparing for sea level rise. And Rockefeller has funded in conjunction with, with RBD to do, look at um, how do we deal with the rising sea levels before it starts happening. Um, and hopefully this will act as a catalytic kind of lighthouse example of, oh, 
man, we should be thinking about this. And, and it's happening in municipalities all over. This has got a lot of um, teeth to it and the ability to, to jump to a higher level. Um, any other questions? Uh, oh, we've got a couple in the back. Yeah, let's take, let's take two in the back. I think this will be our, these are our last two questions. Hi guys, uh, great panel, thanks. So I wanna ask about the, uh -oh. hi. I wanna ask about the future of investing in this sector, if you can call it that. Because even just given all the questions that have been asked, there have been so many different issues that have been touched. The climate change, I think, is as expansive a category as impact investing because you've got, you know, deep tech, hard science stuff, you've got education, you've got agriculture. These are all super urgent um, industries and uh, where there's a huge impact on climate. So how do you mobilize more people to take up this banner? Because tons of people are already doing investing in those areas. And how do you gather them under this tent? And we'll take, we'll take the last question. Hello, it's Paul again. Uh, just to follow up, um, I wasn't thinking about just a couple people doing some innovation. Um, like for example, if you educate a girl through grade 12, they have half the number of children. So if the UN could actually implement what they're doing, they'd have uh, two billion less people by 2045. So if you look at the numbers, the number one thing you gotta do is educate girls on an unbelievably mass scale. And what are you thinking about that? The, 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 the question is, is so to Gene's question, we have a ringer in the audience. Okay. Uh, okay Gene's <laughs> question was, how do we inspire more? And the, the second gentleman's question was a following question to say, should you be investing in climate innovation or should you be investing in educating women because we'll have a much lower population by mid-century? Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, to respond to Jean and, and maybe a little bit uh, to the gentleman as well, I would say um, to pick up on something Melissa talked about, I think as in general, the climate funding, climate investing community is really great at talking to among itself. We like to talk to each other a lot. And what we have to do is get much, much better at telling the story to other types of funders. Um, speaking to some of these issues you raise around, you know, women and, and girls educating young, young women and, and all the benefits that has for climate, but also for lots of different things. Um, I, I also think from Prime's perspective, there's, a, a real role for intermediary groups to play and kind of network groups to play, uh, especially when you're trying to uh, make investments in things that require a lot of expertise. It's, it's very hard for any one individual investor to kind of get smart on everything. Um, so, so building more organizations that can be those trusted third party experts to help channel um, funding and, and vet, uh, you know, investment opportunities, I think, that, that's, that's been a really successful model for us, um, and there's no reason why what we do can't you know, get expanded to other sorts of uh, impact mm. metrics as well. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, we did an interesting exercise for one of our board members a couple of months ago, and he said, we're not funding any climate, so we went through our portfolio of companies and pulled out things that we had, we had turned as agriculture and the rest of them, and, Surprise, surprise, so many of those were about using less water, using less fertilizer, using less diesel, using less. So we went across the companies and pulled out things that we wouldn't necessarily say were climate. But, you know, one was a, a company in India that's doing a refrigeration system for trucks that lowers dramatically the amount of diesel. And if you've been to India and you've seen the thousands of trucks, that's a major impact. And we would have put it in another bucket, but we went through a portfolio. So to answer your question, even though it looks like ag, yeah. it has a dramatic effect on climate. Like mm. I said, less water, less fertilizer, less this, 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 and higher productivity with livelihoods. So you're balancing lowering the carbon footprint and increasing the livelihoods. And again, it was amazing how many of the companies we invest in had that overlay, even though you wouldn't think that. Mm. Yeah, I would totally agree. I, I mean, I think it's a little bit of like code switching in the language that we use. And I think, um, you know, with, with our president now, we've, we've stopped using the word climate change 
and started using the word resiliency and um, <laughs> economic <laughs> impact. Yeah, <laughs> and economic impact and infrastructure and stuff like that. So I think we all know what we're talking about when when we say you know um, this this will uh, reduce the number of like resources you need to use on your agricultural plot. But what we really mean is that that therefore you know you're not using it as much fertilizer. Therefore you're not like running plants as much to, to produce that fertilizer, therefore you're not spitting carbon into the atmosphere, therefore you're not impacting climate change. So I think that we can just get creative in the way that we speak to um, different groups, but um, all have the under, you know, underlying goal um, be the same. Yeah, I think just to, to Jean's question, um, we are good at talking to each other, and I think there are still gaps in each of our ecosystems about where entrepreneurs, what the entry points are, and where they sort of graduate into in terms of capital. So for me, um, we are trying to focus on like continuing to do the piece that we think we have established expertise in and trying to do that well, but making sure that we are talking to um, the venture well programs and knowing where innovation is coming so that we're sort of ready to meet it and then can accelerate it into the next stages of capital that it needs to be met with. Um, and, and I think that sort of getting clear about what stage you can play in and then making sure your connections are as strong at either end of the other links of the chain are hopefully what will move everybody along um, in a tent that's big enough. And to the question about girls' education, um, education is one of the other sectors that we work in. Um, and there's, as has been mentioned, a lot of interplay between those. It is not, sp it has not been a specific focus on girls' education, but I hear your point loudly and um, take note of that as one of the, you know, SDG or, you know, main goals under moving climate. And I think that's where, again, we need to think about how does philanthropy, if, if that in and of itself is a tenant to moving climate change hasn't, uh, made it into our investment thesis as like how do we find for-profit enterprises that are achieving that goal and getting to the impact we want, then how do we work with the right pools of philanthropic capital um, that can achieve that goal since we're working towards the same end? I would just add that I was in a session yesterday with a lot of funders, foundations, government people together, and I think given the current governmental um, administration, it's forcing us, for better or for worse, to work together more to see what's having, what's having to the budget, how can we play a role so a lot of these things kind of don't drop. So if USAID PACE can't fund something, can we fund something? Can other foundations? So I think I'm, we're seeing a lot more collaboration because foundations traditionally have not played well together. But I think we're finally starting to see if we're going to move the needle, we've got to move in a collaborative effort much more. And in, we work in India for the last 15, 20 years, and I think for the first time ever, we're seeing a lot more synergy among players, a lot more cooperation. I mean, a lot of funders, several foundations are funding with Village Capital that we fund. And so I think you're seeing a lot more collaboration that I think is really encouraging. And a lot of what comes out of it is clean energy, clean tech type investment, because I think we see that as the future. So. Yeah. I'm not usually optimistic, but I think we are seeing, you know, what can I say? Um, but I think we are seeing a move in the right direction. I would add two quick things that I would agree with everything that everybody said, and we're way out of time, but um, I think we have to demonstrate impact. I think that that's such a way to bring more traditional funders into this space by showing that, yes, these design and engineering hardware solutions are delivering significant impact, and that potentially a dollar invested in one of these could yield more than the farther, you know, service delivery models that are farther downstream. Um, I would also add, too, to your point about the current administration um, uh, inspiring action. Um, we feel that palpably as a company. So as the corporate donor up here, the executives on our, our C-suite are saying, what more can we do? Because suddenly the government is not taking care of the social welfare and we need to do more, which is unfortunate, but it's also a great thing. So. Um, Thank you all. I see other people coming in. I appreciate you guys all coming. Thank you to this uh, panel. It's been a wonderful discussion, and I think we're here for a few minutes to discuss. Thank you.